Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Rock Island, where we are taking a look at a 10mm Colt Double Eagle. Not Colt's greatest hit. Unfortunately for Colt, there are a lot of guns that could qualify as not Colt's greatest hit. Anyway, today let's, let's start by hearkening back to the early days of military and police service handguns. And first, there were revolvers, naturally. And the only thing, at first, that could compete with a revolver as a military or police sidearm was going to be a single-action, hammer-fired automatic. Basically a 1911. Now, what would eventually pick up in the late 1980s and into the 1990s as the next hot tactical trend would be still a single-stack automatic, still an external hammer-fired, but double-action in addition to single-action. We can pretend that this was uh, invented by Smith & Wesson. Uh, it was certainly done well by Smith & Wesson. We'll ignore the fact that the Germans were doing this in World War II uh, with the P-38. But that became the hot trend. And it was only after that that we would then start to see people transitioning to striker-fired pistols. The idea with a double action was, ah, you can carry it safely without a manual safety. Uh, but then, of course, the downside is your first trigger pull is very long and heavy, and your second trigger pull is very short and light. And so if you don't train with it a lot, you will have problems with either the first shot or the second shot going where you want them to. And the striker-fired pistol was seen to be a solution to that. You had a safe, uh, a safe action style of trigger as general, well, not invented by Glock, but as best exemplified by Glock, so that you didn't need to use a manual safety, but you also had the same trigger press every time, thereby increasing the effective practical accuracy of the gun. So that's kind of our transition over time. Well, if we go back to the 1990s, Colt tried to get in on this trend at the double-action hammer-fired automatic stage with the Double Eagle. They called this their Series 90 gun. It would follow the Series 70 1911, and then there was the Series 80 1911 with some improved safety mechanisms. And then there was the Series 90 where they stuck a double... basically they just stuck a double-action trigger on the 1911. Now, the example that we have here is pretty cool in that it's not just a double eagle, it's a 10mm double eagle, and it's not even just that. This happens to be a gun that was actually sent to the FBI for evaluation and potential adoption. Obviously that didn't happen, but we'll get to that in a moment. First, let's take a look at what this is and what Colt did to it. Here you have it right in big letters on the side of the slide. It is Colt's Double Eagle. You get it? It's a Double Eagle because it's double action. And in case you don't get it, there's two eagles to make sure that you get that it's a Double Eagle. Those are in fact eagles, not elephants. And it's uh, Series 90, which is the natural successor to their Series 80 pistol. There's a very light marking on the other side that says Colt Double Action 10mm. And then the serial number and manufacturer mark here uh, was ground off and remarked when this was sent to the FBI for testing. Now, mechanically, fundamentally, this is a 1911 in terms of uh, the locking action. Uh, the, the whole slide assembly is standard 1911. Uh, in fact, the frame is too, pretty much. It's the trigger mechanism that has been changed. They pretty much took the trigger mechanism from the C-Camp double action conversion and applied it here. Um, they also redesigned the trigger guard in a way that was popular at this time. This, is, this was, by the way, introduced in 1990. And so you've got the serrated finger pad on the front of the trigger guard that in theory helps you hold the muzzle down. Um, that's another one of those things kind of like double action automatics, um, or SADA automatics, single action, double action automatics, that used to be the hot thing and is not really the hot thing anymore. Um, we have a magazine here that holds eight rounds of 10mm automatic. These were offered in a variety of calibers, 45, 10mm, 40 Smith & Wesson, 9mm, and 38 Super. So pretty much Colt's whole caliber lineup they offered uh, in the Double Eagle. The controls are the same as a standard 1911 with the magazine release, the slide release. However, they have added a decocker. So if I cock the hammer, I can use that lever to decock it. It's kind of just wedged in here, in between these other two bits. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a problem, but it does seem a bit cramped and awkward. 
there was one other change in the controls, and that is because it has the double action trigger mechanism, uh, Colt got rid of the grip safety. So this is just a, a plastic insert uh, to take the place of the original 1911 grip safety. But then the place we are going to get into trouble, where Colt in fact did get into trouble with these, was under the grips. You'll notice that the grip panels are extended beyond what a normal 1911 would have. A um, little bit here, but primarily on this side. And that's to cover the changes to the trigger mechanism, because they're pretty much all external to the frame, which I suspect was done to minimize the uh, necessary changes to the actual machining of the frame. So this is the, this is the nice side. We'll take a look at both in turn. All right, under this grip panel we have this little guy. Uh, that is a very thin wire spring, one might mistake for a paper clip, that's hooked into a little tiny hole in the frame, and it's hooked into the trigger bar here. So this is what actually connects the trigger to, or, well, this is what allows the trigger to actually pull the sear. On the 1911 you have uh, trigger bars that go back into the frame. On this they need more space, and so this, this pops off. Uh, you know what, we're going to leave that in there. But this will come off fairly easily once you take the grip panels off, because there's nothing in there to retain it. So that's that side. Now I'm going to put the grip panel back on, because if I flip this over with the grip panel off, this stuff will fall out. All right, this side is the one where, if you're not lucky, the spring can just jump out at you uh, when you take the grip panel off. And that's a really funky shaped spring. It does in fact kind of always just pop out of its attachment points when you take the grip panel off. But this uh, strange curvature there, and this is the decocker spring that's going to return the decocker when it's not in use. So we have it sits in this slot, and then it's supposed to go in that little hole there and that little hole there. If you're very, if you're careful and lucky, it will stay in position like that. If you're not, it bounces out like that. So if you have one of these, be careful when you take it apart. Be aware of this lurking under the left side grip panel. And by the way, once you take this out, the lever comes out, and then the little pin comes out, and you, you don't want to lose all this stuff. So we'll put all that back in. You can see here, though, how the double action system has basically been grafted onto the outside of the, the frame, where if this had been a gun designed as a double action pistol from the ground up, a lot of these parts could have been internal, uh, would be much better designed as internal parts, and you'd avoid a lot of these issues. So kind of have a little bit of the Lama Omni school of trigger mechanism design going on here. All right. No. See if we can get this to stay in place long enough for me to put the grip panel back on. Nope. It really doesn't like to stay down. Nope. All right. So backup plan. We are going to use a flat screwdriver to hold that in place, and then drop the grip panel on. There we go. That should have done it. I've been a bit harsh to Colt here, but in reality this wasn't a terrible gun. Uh, it was a reasonably good gun that had marketing problems, and a lot of this stems from just the look of the gun. They were trying to sell this as the next evolution of the 1911, but to folks who really appreciate the classic design of the 1911, this is going to be very off-putting. Um, the plastic grips are going to be very off-putting. They're trying to combine the styling of a more modern tactical pistol with the market base of a more classic streamlined pistol. And unfortunately for them, whether the gun's good or not, or rather even if the gun's good, that, that mismatch of audience and design is going to cause them problems. Now there would be a second generation, a, a Mark II version of the Double Eagle that would solve some of these problems. In, in particular, it would add some retaining plates so that you didn't have this issue of springs popping out when you took the grip panels off. That's a good thing, they probably should have done that in the first place. But even having done that, the gun still just wasn't 
competitive in the marketplace. The problem was, basically in a nutshell, it was the gun was more expensive than the comparable Smith & Wesson, something like a 4506 or one of the 10 millimeter Smith & Wesson autos, but it wasn't actually quite as good as the Smith & Wesson automatics. And so why would you buy it? And so nobody really did. And by 1997, the gun had been dropped from production, and Colt would look for some other... Colt went through a lot of guns that they tried selling during this time period. We have the, the Z40 licensed from SIG. They were looking at licensing uh, basically a Beretta 92 clone uh, from Vector in South Africa. They would have the Colt All-American 2000, which would be even less successful, I suspect, than this. This was not a kind decade for Colt. In fact, it hasn't been a kind several decades for Colt. But um, all that aside, the Double Eagle is a cool collectible piece now, because it wasn't all that successful. So hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, getting this look at the outside and the inside of a Double Eagle. And it's actually really cool to have one that was sent to the FBI. That's a, a cool piece of firearms history there. Thanks for watching.